Okay guys, this is a video today. Uh, I actually wanted to record this video in light of the acquisition of Bethesda Game Studios um, and all their subsidiaries by Microsoft. And um, I wanted to voice my opinions on that um, and everything that Microsoft's been doing and, and what's been going on. But honestly, the first thing that came to my mind when I heard that Microsoft was acquiring Bethesda and that they had acquired, acquired Compulsion Games a while ago and that they had acquired uh, uh, Obsidian Entertainment and now they own uh, you know, the Elder Scrolls and now they own everything that Obsidian's done and is doing and um, they have all these little studios, the Stalker Studio, they bought up the Stalker Studio and now they're doing uh, Stalker 2. Uh, now they own Arcane Studios, so any future immersive sims coming out of Arcane are going to be uh, done through Microsoft Studios. And the first thing that came to my mind was, okay, where is, why do they not, why has, has no one at other side and why has no one at Microsoft said, hmm, those other side guys are working on System Shock 3. Uh, we're, we're, I mean, like... Obsidian Entertainment, I mean, they're not nobody, but it's not, like, the biggest deal in the universe. Compulsion Games, especially. I personally wasn't a huge fan of We Happy Few, but they bought them up. I think the Stalker guys are even kind of a bigger deal that Microsoft bought them, because, you know, uh, Stalker's very popular in Eastern Europe, and it, it has a cult following in the States, but I wouldn't say that that would be, like, a huge money-making success. Like, it is a smaller studio, and they've had issues in the past, so... I, you know, System Shock 3, that's a bankable IP, and a lot of the people working at other side are very talented, and they were some of the original pioneers in Looking Glass Studios. So, for me, it's kind of a no-brainer. Why wouldn't you want to bring these guys into the fold? And the thing about what's going on with Microsoft is, uh, so for example, anecdotally, uh, Tim Schafer, I mean, look at Tim Schafer. The dude has had no trouble producing his own funding for his projects. I mean, what was it? Uh, the game about the... I forget what the game was called. I'm going to look at it real quick right here. Yeah, Tim Schafer's game, uh, Broken Age, uh, I think he had enough funding and then he kind of ran out, so he did the first half and then he said, okay, can we do episode two? And if I'm remembering the story correctly, he got way more money than he asked for on Kickstarter. Same thing with Psychonauts 2, he got way more money than he asked for. Um, so it, basically every time that he's gone on Kickstarter for money, it hasn't been an issue. He's run his own studio for years now. and. It seems that they've had complete creative freedom and autonomy to do what they want. So why would a guy like Tim Schafer go to, you know, the big evil mega corporation Microsoft? Well, they must have offered him a pretty sweet deal. And anecdotally, at least the, the what, what we're hearing through the grapevine is they basically told him, um, do you want a bunch of money and, and nobody looking over your shoulder? Like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get in your way. We're not gonna tell you what to do. You have just as much autonomy as you have now, but you've got Microsoft backing you up. We'll give you as much money as you need for whatever. And so he signed the deal. I mean, this is a guy who, I mean, his whole, like, identity is, I mean, we could talk about his, his personality. He seems okay. What I'm saying is he doesn't seem like the guy to want to be some sort of corporate sellout or something like that. So he wouldn't have sided with Microsoft. He wouldn't have gone with Microsoft Game Studios if there wasn't a pretty sweet deal. And... This is what we're seeing with a lot of the other studios that they're acquiring. They're not get, they're not stepping on anyone's toes. Um, they're they're not, you know, designing by committee because I think someone at Microsoft realized, hmm, the reason that games are sucking and the sales are declining and all of this stuff is all the games feel the same these days. Um, studios aren't allowed to do what they want to do. Many modern games have been ruined by studio interference or, or, or excuse me, publisher interference. And I think that someone at Microsoft finally realized, you know, we can beat Sony at their own game, we can have tons of exclusives, but the problem with Sony is that Sony's exclusives all feel the same. Because there's probably some executive Sony committee that says you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. Whereas Microsoft's saying, you know what, 
We're, we have enough FU money to throw anything at the wall and see what sticks. And so they've been gobbling up studios like crazy in order to find the next great IP. And they've been um, keeping off people's toes. For better or... For better or worse, I mean, as we saw with the Halo Infinite trailer, like, do you really think Microsoft is down there with uh, whips and, uh, you know, uh, the guy with the, the hood on his head and the drum on the on the slave rowboat, you know, just whipping people into shape over at 343 to make sure it comes out perfect? Absolutely not. That was honestly kind of a shit show. Uh, the graphics didn't look well. There were some frame drops. Well, they didn't look very good. There were many frame drops. Uh... It looked like a last-gen game because technically it, it was a last-gen game. It was supposed to come out for the Xbox One and the Xbox One X. So, but as much as that's a bad thing for Halo and it shows maybe some mismanagement, that's mismanagement as, at 343. Microsoft is giving them all the support they need. They said, here's some money. Here's a showcase that, well, we didn't really have E3 this year, but the equivalent of E3, you know, show your stuff off. It seems that they are letting the creators sink or swim on their own accord um, in order to get some fantastic IPs out of them. And so, honestly, at this point in the, in the other side game, I can't think of a better situation for them. The biggest problem that Looking Glass Studios faced was not critical acclaim, it was not problems making good games, and it was not a lack of creativity. Alright? As far, from, from the the main line entries in the games that they made, it never got stale, it never got tired, their ideas were always fresh, they were always pushing the technology to the cutting edge, and um, they were critically well received. The, the biggest issues with Other Side were stabil financial stability and not being able to get their products marketed properly or enough support from the publisher to make sure that they could be marketed properly or appropriately. You know, the only game that they made, in my opinion, that was adequately marketed was Thief. And wouldn't you know it, growing up, it's the only Looking Glass Studios game I was even aware of. You know, I was alive during all these other releases, System Shock 1, System Shock 2. Uh, I mean, I wasn't gaming when Ultima Underworld came out, but I never saw like extra copies at used bookstores or anything like that. Um, I had I never heard of Flight Unlimited in my life. Uh, and some of the other games that they worked on. But Thief I heard of because Eidos felt like, hmm, this, we, we've got lightning in a bottle here. Let's market the hell out of this. And they did. I mean, they included it with the demo discs. There were magazine spreads. Um, there wasn't really a TV spot or anything for it, like with Tomb Raider, but there was a trailer that I think was making the rounds on the internet and was included on other game discs and was included like in PC Gamer Magazine. You could, I think trailers were included so they were doing adequate marketing and that's when Looking Glass had their biggest successes and the only reason that they had to close as a studio was because despite having some financial successes towards the end of their run they first of all hadn't gotten paid royalties yet for Thief 2 which actually made a decent amount of money it was another big seller um, but they had so many other projects that just lost money and I honestly think they didn't lose money because they were bad I thought I think they lost money because the publishers weren't good at marketing the product and the products were very costly because Looking Glass was always trying to push the envelope with technology. So I think that what other side needs right now is exactly that. They need stability to be able to see projects through to their conclusion and they need marketing. Underworld Descendant was terribly marketed, okay? There was some good stuff at the beginning, but I think when it be, first of all, they lost one or two publishers on that project. And then I think for 505, when it became apparent that it was a sort of unfinished game, 505 said, you know, let's just release it. But at the very early stage of its development cycle, uh, Underworld Ascendant, it got some E3 spots, it got a Kickstarter video, it was making the rounds on the internet, people were talking about it, so the marketing was okay. But closer to release, it totally dropped off. Totally dropped off. And the other big thing with Underworld Ascendant was they just didn't have the stability. As I've talked about in a couple of other videos now, you know, they ascend they worked on the game for about three, three and a half years, or it was in development, let's say, for three, three and a half years, maybe four years. Most of what we're playing right now 
an underworld ascendant was done in about nine to twelve months according to um statements that other side has released this isn't speculation or hearsay this is these are statements that other side has released and that explains everything that i need to know about the project that they just i mean literally the publisher just backed out and they were left with nothing but the kickstarter money which you know a couple hundred grand is not enough to fund a project for three years okay especially when you got a team of i don't know uh, 15 to 20 people they all need salaries it's just not going to work so they're running into the same issues that Looking Glass Studios was running into, trying to be in a small independent studio and, and make cutting edge games and do all this stuff. And that's why that didn't come out. And the reason System Shock 3 is having trouble is that from what internal sources say, have said, you know, previous people who've worked on the project, the, pe the previous, I believe, uh, lead designer said that, look, you know, we had a small budget, we had a small team, what we were making was pretty cool, but is it System Shock 3? No. That's essentially what he said. He said, I don't think it would have been the System Shock 3 that people are hoping for in terms of System Shock 3. He said, I think it would have been a... For an indie game, he said it was very impressive and very uh, cutting edge. He said, but for System Shock 3 and System... The System Shocks are sort of widely considered AAA games. He's like, it's not... It's not a triple A AAA system shock three, and I think people ultimately would have been disappointed. So I think other side was trying to make do with what they had, and they had said, "Oh yeah, we've got funding for this and that for system shock." But you know, then Starbreeze Studios left, and they said, "No, no, it's fine." But then all of a sudden they go quiet. Well, they released that trailer even after Starbreeze Studios had backed out. That trailer at uh, I forget what it was, uh, some game convention or E3 or something. Come on. Um, I think last year, last October, and then we didn't hear anything, and then all of a sudden in May, they're like, yeah, Tencent's involved now. And, te you know, it's like, here, you gotta choose the lesser of two evils, between Microsoft and Tencent. Now, Microsoft acquiring all these studios may be bad down the line. Right now, they're giving them creative freedom, but we don't know if there's gonna be changes in, in uh, Microsoft's board of directors that, that uh, looks over Xbox. Um, and Games Pass and Microsoft Game Studios. We don't know if uh, key people are going to leave that are that have been making these good decisions. We don't know. So it could be 5, 10, 15 years down the line that this is the worst thing to happen for these studios because Microsoft's just going to start, you know, squeezing the blood out of the stones, you know, so to speak, um, with these companies and they're just going to bleed them dry and then, you know, kind of pull an EA and be like, oh, you're not making money anymore? You're canned. You're not making money anymore? You're canned. They could do that. You know, Microsoft has pulled some bullshit in the past, but ever since that fateful E3 where they had all that super anti-consumer shit in the Xbox One and they got lambasted for it, Microsoft has been on damage control. They've been on damage control for what, six years, six, seven years? Because they're like, you know what, we need to... and and. So far, we need to sell this as a service. We need to sell Xbox as not just a, a, a black plastic brick that you keep in your house that plays games. Um, we need to sell it as a whole thing, you know? And honestly, between Xbox and PlayStation right now, Xbox is the much better value, especially moving into the newer consoles. Xbox One, or the Xbox Series S, X, uh, uh, stands to be the more powerful of the two consoles which is the mistake microsoft made last time is being like woefully underpowered compared to the ps4 i mean it was outputting uh, 960p for most games while the ps4 could at least put out solid true 1080 on on most games the xbox one cannot all right and 1080p was already on the way out 4k was already standardized at that point all right so that was one of their big mistakes before and now you know, out of the gate, they're saying, no, our console's more powerful, it's got a better GPU, it's got better this, it's got better that. They gave it to the press earlier than Sony did. They said, here's all the stuff, take a look at it. They, uh, Games Pass is a phenomenal value. And it is a, it is changing the nature of how a lot of these games can be experienced by the public. For example, I, one of the things I love about Games Pass is I'm able to, like, f if I'm playing, uh, Firewatch is a good example. Firewatch is a game that I was really fired up about forgive the uh um word choice there i was really fired up about and i thought it was going to be something different and when i got it and i played it i was like oh it's another stupid 
uh, walking simulator about some guy trying to, I don't know, navigate hit the emotions in his life or having a midlife crisis or something like that. Um, or dealing with alcoholism or anything like that, uh, that that we've seen a million times in these indie stories. I thought it was going to be more like a firefighting, like a, a national park firefighting simulator. That's what I thought it was going to be. And I was like, this is fucking cool. And it just was a stupid like, oh, somebody was murdered here years ago. We have to find out what happened. Just boring shit. Now, for the single experience I had with it, it was fine. But I am a little bit uh, remorseful that I purchased it and I own it. Because now it's just taking up space in my Steam library. Um, and I'm, I'm probably never going to play it again. But the perfect avenue for a one-off experience like that, that you don't necessarily want to pen, pay 10 bucks for, but you do want to play, and it's like a two or three hour game, is Games Pass. Because you're already pay it's like Netflix, you're already paying like 10 bucks a month, and then you have access to all of these games. And if you don't like it, if I'm, if I'm like, wait, this is turning into a, a sappy emotional walking simulator with some sort of like uh, greater themes and metaphors about life, you can just turn it off and go do something else. I mean, I played uh, Warhammer uh, Inquisitor Martyr, which is, I didn't think I was going to like it. I'm not usually a top-down kind of guy, um, unless it's like critically acclaimed like the original Fallout or something. But I gave it a try, and I'm actually absolutely loving it. I mean, it is kind of like turn your brain off and just play a couple missions game, but sometimes it's fun to have those casual experiences. And I just really got into 40k recently, so it's been fantastic. Um, uh, Euro Truck Simulator and stuff like that. Stuff I would never in a million years spend hard-earned cash on in the Steam store. I can check out and say, hmm, maybe I do like this game. I don't know. You know? Uh, Near Automata. I'm really not into Japanese games. I, th there's something about their storytelling methods and, and cultural influence and stuff like that that the, the games just, I, they don't click with me. I get too annoyed with a lot of their cultural interjection or injection into them that just like, it's very cringy. Um, but I checked out Nier Automata because everyone was talking about it, and I ended up kind of enjoying it, you know? Uh, so Games Pass gives you the ability to check out games at a, in a very low-risk situation. And honestly, I think that's where a lot of these walking sims and indie sims need to go, and it's a fantastic value. It has saved me so much money and time and trouble and remorse, too. I don't have to be like, oh, damn, I bought that stupid game and it turned out to be a, a walking sim or it turned out to be an Outlast clone or something like that. Um, and it, it's really fantastic and basically they're just providing a, an insane amount of value to the consumer and they're also giving a lot of creative freedom to their studios. And so in light of that, I think honestly the best possible thing that could happen to other side entertainment is for them to... Uh, you know, pull up their skirt or something from across the bar, you know, show a little leg or something like that to uh, to Microsoft and be like, hey, could you buy us? Could you absorb us into the, the big, giant, gelatinous, amorphous blob that is becoming Microsoft Game Studios? Because, look, I mean, they're going to have a powerhouse of talent underneath them with, with Bethesda and with Arcane. And um, if that's that's what i'm saying this is exactly the the environment that other side needs right now and and i think you know like i said it could go bad down the road but i think for at least the next five to ten years microsoft is probably going to be on good behavior with how they treat their their uh first party studios and so this is the perfect opportunity for other side to get the footing that they need to actually start making some great games again um and they won't have to worry about money as much, and they can make the games a little bit larger scope if they want to, and they can take longer to work on them if they're not right, you know? Versus Tencent, I mean, I don't trust Tencent at all, and I don't think anyone does, and I think everyone's very dismayed at this recent development with System Shock. Well, not even recent, that was months ago, but we haven't heard anything about it. So, whoever ears this video falls on, I, I would say to you if you have anything to do with this or if you don't or if you're just a fan and you want to voice your opinion i would say uh petition or 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 make your voice heard that uh, microsoft should be or other sides should approach microsoft about acquisition or vice versa because i think it would be great and i think it's foolish of microsoft not to realize huh that's a bankable franchise underworld maybe not as much but system shock that's a bankable franchise you know just check out the view comparison to the Underworld Ascendant announcement trailer on Other Side's YouTube channel to the System Shock 3 announcement trailer on their YouTube channel. 
I mean, it's got like, I think the Underworld is like sub 10k views and the System Shock is uh, a couple hundred thousand or more. Um, and again, you know, Microsoft seems to be comfortable buying these studios, these indie studios that aren't going to require as much money and are going to release maybe smaller scale products. So I think it just would work out for Betty, ever, it would work out better for everybody in the end. Um, and to talk more about the Bethesda acquisition, I have, for the past four Three to five years, I have long held the belief that the, you know, everyone complains about all the shit that Bethesda's been pulling. You know, releasing uh, Skyrim 50 million times, all the terrible decisions they made with uh, uh, Fallout 76, the fact that they essentially shit canned the Dishonored franchise, um, and shit canned a lot of uh, what Arcane was doing at the time because they were they didn't like the sales on Prey and they didn't like the sales on Dishonored 2. Well, Dishonored 2, I still don't understand what happened there. I think, honestly, it was PC backlash. Um, I know that the PC launch was kind of a mess, but it was only a mess for a month or two. After that, the game worked fine. They just needed to release a patch, and everything worked fine. But people just, they were like, it doesn't run perfect on day one, and it's just, you can't, you can't expect a game, especially for PC, to run perfectly on day one in this day and age. You just can't. I mean, there's too many different hardware configurations, there's too many different driver issues that may or may not come up that they don't know about. You can't just expect it to work flawlessly on day one. So I don't, I understood what happened with Prey, though. Prey was poorly marketed. I mean, I didn't even know what it was supposed to be. I didn't know till I played it. I was like, oh, it's just System Shock. Okay, now I understand. But I was like, wait, is this a sequel to that weird game from like 2007 where you play as like that Native American dude who like can't die? You go to this like nether realm and you like there's like no death mechanic and it was on the Doom 3 engine. I'm like, how is this related to that? And I picked it up just because I was like, how does this have anything to do with that? Um, but it's just, just so it was poorly marketed. I mean, it's a very slow paced, methodical game that requires a lot of thought and input and ingenuity from the player. Whereas Prey... Um, Prey requires, the original Prey requires some puzzle solving, but it is also a, an id style sort of, uh, runny jumpy shooter. Um, and, and the fact that they shit canned those, the way that they've treated Fallout, the way that they've treated Elder Scrolls, the fact that there's, it's in development, but we still haven't seen anything in nine years. Nine years since the last Elder Scrolls game? That's ridiculous. And... Um, the fact that they're still sticking with that stupid engine that they need to get, they need to make a new engine. Um, the fact that we still don't know anything about Starfield. Is that the one? Is that what it's, I think it's called Starfield. But whatever their space, um, RPG is supposed to be. Um, the missteps they made with Fallout 4. Uh, the cringy SJW politics that started to seep into, uh, the Wolfenstein series. I'm kind of of the mind that not all of these, but many of these things were not made by Bethesda, uh, game studios or Bethesda Softworks or any of those individual companies. I think they were made by the parent company. I think it's just Bethesda Studios or Bethesda something, or just called Bethesda, um, which is really just ZeniMax Media. And I think that the issue that Bethesda's been having over the past several years has been ZeniMax. It hasn't been, you know, Bethesda has a great track record. You know what I mean? Morrowind was fantastic. The original Elder Scrolls games were fantastic. Oblivion was fantastic and it blew everyone's fucking mind. Fallout 3 was fantastic, it blew everyone's mind. And then they shifted the, the development over to Fallout New Vegas for the other guys. That blew everyone's mind. Um, and then Skyrim blew everyone's fucking mind. Like, they were just like hit after hit after hit after hit. And then Fallout 4 was pretty good, but it had some issues. And all of a sudden we get 76, and they've outsourced basically most of the game to some random third company that, that ZeniMax put together. And then they cut so many corners under the behest of ZeniMax that the game sucked. And then Bethesda, you know, Todd Howard and his team have to go out and apologize constantly for all this crap. And it's like, I'm sure that they had very little to do with that decision making, or they weren't even allowed to be part of the decision making process. They were just told this is the way it's going to be. Because it seems that ZeniMax has just been trying to, they gave everyone a little bit of creative freedom at the beginning, and then they're just like, well, now everything has to be as bankable as Skyrim, and if it's not, we're going we're gonna to fuck with you. You know, I was really worried there that Arcane was going to be on the chopping block, because the last two or three games that they've released haven't, I mean, that's the thing. How do you how do you determine what is something that has done well versus something that hasn't done well? And I you know, if you look at the sales of Dishonored 2, if you look at um, the sales of Prey, 
And if you look at the critical acclaim and just the amount of people that are still talking about those games after their release, there's no way that they couldn't have been profitable. Unless there was just such rampant financial mismanagement in the project that the costs blew out of control. I think I did a little research on it and it's almost impossible for the games to have not made profit by now. Especially with Steam sales and people hearing about it word of mouth. I mean, Prey was like, Prey was almost like Rainbow Six Siege is where it had a rocky launch, but word of mouth helped. Siege was different where they had to fix the game to get word of mouth. But ultimately, between the two games, word of mouth helped actually bolster sales beyond the original projections. Um, I mean, Prey is probably not, if you would look at the data now, I don't know if anyone would consider it a poor selling game. Um, because it's it's kind of everywhere like a lot of people play it a lot of people are talking about it they even made prey moon crash i don't know i just don't think that they're the financial failures that zenimax has said they are um i think they're just financial failures because they're used to you know the fallout 4 revenue or the skyrim revenue and they're just like yeah this is if it didn't make six billion dollars we don't give a shit so I'm happy to see that but th that Microsoft is just like, Zenimax, you don't know what you're doing anymore. We're just taking this away from you. Um, if all you care about is money, here's a bunch of it, because we have more than we know what to do with. And now we're just going to let these studios do what they want. That's honestly what I feel this move is about. And it's also a big fuck you to Sony, because it's just like, hey, Sony, if you want to have uh, the next Elder Scrolls or the next Fallout, on your system, you're gonna have to come crawling to us. Or, we're gonna tell you no, because you've been screwing us with the exclusives for the past six years. So, we're just gonna tell you no. And it's gonna be PC and Xbox exclusive. So, it's a pretty Chad move on Microsoft's part. And honestly, when I got my Xbox, I was a little dismayed. I mean, it didn't run as well as the PS4. All the exclusives on the PS4 looked amazing. And, um, I felt like I got the wrong console, but after, because uh, my buddy got a PS4, so he let me borrow it, and I got to play most of the exclusives that I missed out on, and I didn't really like hardly any of them. God of War was okay, I guess. Horizon Zero Dawn, I thought was, it was beautiful, but I it felt like an Ubisoft game, so just kind of felt boring, like a collect-a-thon and just a big empty open world, and um, the only one I really liked was Uncharted. And that's the only series I wish would just come to PC already, is Uncharted. And even the other ones, like all of the David Cage games, eventually came to PC. And I think they're even going to be cross-platform now. Um, Death Stranding, because of the fallout with Konami, I think. Well, that's PC now, and I'm, I'm pretty sure at some point it's going to hit uh, Xbox as well. So, um, basically, in 2014, I really felt like I made the wrong choice buying an Xbox One. Here in 2020, I have had, I've gotten the opportunity, their, their game sales on Xbox, the digital game sales are phenomenal, they're better than Steam most of the time, so you get better discounts on digital games. Uh, games Pass, I've gotten to play more games than I, I, I have more games on there than I know what to do with, it's almost overwhelming. Um, and it's not really that expensive, plus I, my first four or five months of Games Pass were like, I paid four dollars for all of it because they had this crazy special. Um, yeah, it's it's just become a console that is really, it's a much better value. And now that it's gonna be the more powerful console and they've got all these great exclusive studios coming in, I really think that they're gonna give Sony a run for their money. And again, this is not a Microsoft versus Sony thing. This is just what I'm saying is that I think Microsoft realized that they screwed up so badly with the Xbox One launch that what they're trying to do is make the console a great value to consumers and they're trying to make the platform, Microsoft Game Studios and Xbox in general, the preferred place to be for developers no matter what kind of developer you are. You're AAA, you're indie, you're super indie, you're like three guys in a basement. They're saying, we want you with us. That seems to be the message that they're putting out. Um, putting out there right now so like I said um, and and to get to sort of the title of this video would Microsoft please just buy other side already so we can get out of this financial turmoil and not knowing what's going on and uh, making deals with Chinese companies that are just gonna ruin the game can we just can we just all step back and say Microsoft please please just buy other side entertainment already um, 
Now, and I don't think it's that big of a stretch. I mean, look, Stalker. Uh, System Shock is just as bankable, if not more, than the Stalker franchise. Uh, so, they bought Stalker. Why not buy uh, System Shock? Oh, and to clarify, so this, this has been a sort of a point of confusion among a lot of people thus far, is um, who owns the rights to System Shock? And I, I, I thought it was Night Dive. But then in the Noclip documentary, they said, oh, well, uh, no, System Shock was actually owned by the Star Insurance Company because they bought up all of, they, they somehow fell into all of Looking Glass's um, intellectual property uh, some years back after, after it all got dumped by all the previous owners. Um, so that's how Night Dive got the rights to do System Shock uh, not only the remake, but also the 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 enhanced edition on uh, Steam, where you can play it on modern hardware. And now the enhanced edition is even better because you can play it in modern res resolution because they've imported it into the Kex engine. Um, and they got that by approaching Star, but apparently they outright bought the System Shock IP from Star Insurance Company um, some years back. That's not 100% confirmed. I got that from Shodanpedia, but that makes a lot more sense because people have been throwing around the idea that Night Dive owns the entire IP now. And I'm thinking like, well, if this star insurance company owns it, then it, that could muddy the waters with what's going on with the whole IP. But it, it also makes sense that Night Dive at some point would just say, hey, well, there's a lot that we want to do with this IP. We want to re-release an enhanced edition of System Shock 2. We're doing a remake of System Shock 1. Um, we did the enhanced edition of System Shock 1. We want to sell our own merch. Let's just buy the IP. Um, so, uh, yeah, just to clarify that, because I know it's been a point of confusion, yes, uh, as far as I can tell from the research I conduct I've conducted, uh, Night Dive does, uh, they now officially own the, the IP for System Shock 3, or for System Shock, which means that um, if System Shock 3 sucks for whatever reason and, and other side can't figure out what to do with it or the, the Tencent ruins it, that's not the end for System Shock. Or even System Shock 3, Night Dive could very easily uh, just say, hey, that's not canon, and just make it their sell themselves or hand it off to another studio. Maybe Arcane. And that's another thing I'm happy about with this Microsoft acquisition too. What I was saying is since Microsoft is being so benevolent right now, um, as long as they continue to be as benevolent as they appear to be right now, I mean, this could be a renaissance for Bethesda, for Arcane, um, and for some of these genres of games. Now all we gotta do is make sure that they buy up other side and, and maybe even get the rights to uh, Thief and Deus Ex. That would be something. Warren Spector, Paul Nerath, working other side, Microsoft acquires Deus Ex rights, they, they acquire uh, the rights to Thief, and then they can make some sequels to those franchises. Or at least advise on the sequels. If they want Arcane to do them, or, or so one of the other studios, Obsidian or something like that, at least they can advise and say, this is what we would do, this is what we think is a good idea. Um, because, yeah, Deus Ex needs to be snapped from the jaws of Square Enix as well uh, as Thief. They're not doing anything with those IPs. They've they've wrote them off as a loss because they made, once again, they did ZeniMax-style bad business decisions. And my only hope right now with, with uh, Microsoft's magnanimousness is that they are going to be committed to a principle of allowing creative freedom because they are looking at the mistakes that so many other publishers and, and IP owners have made, like with Thief 2014 or like with Deus Ex Mankind Divided where they have uh, kneecapped their own fucking projects in an effort to try and make them more demographically viable. Um, rather than realizing if you focus on a single demographic that's going to buy it anyways and you make it excellent, they will buy it in droves, rather than trying to appeal to everyone and you get a little drop in the bucket from every demographic. And then it gets bad word of mouth. And I th I'm really hoping that someone at Microsoft finally realized, like, yeah, the Xbox can be as badass as you want, but if it doesn't have awesome games and we're not making sure they're awesome by staying out of developers' way, uh, staying out of their way, then it doesn't matter who has the best hardware or whose console looks the coolest or who has the most word of mouth about like gigaflops or this or whatever. It doesn't matter. Or teraflops, I think it's now. Um, it doesn't matter if no one wants to play any of the fucking games on it. So I think that's what they've realized and they're really just pushing like we just need good content on the system. 
Because honestly, I think that was the biggest issue with the last generation. I was struggling the other day to think of what was the best game I played in this generation. Um, it could have been Prey, maybe, but Prey didn't blow my socks off. I'm just impressed with Prey's systems and its design philosophy. The game in and of itself, it holistically, didn't really blow my socks off. Unfortunately, uh, the most pedestrian answer, uh, or my answer is going to be very pedestrian, is I think the, the one game that really kind of like stole the show for me and I can't stop thinking about and I really loved um, and was really kind of like a next-gen experience for me and, and something different and, and not the same type of game I'd played before and just stole hundreds of hours of my time was uh, Witcher 3. It wasn't Fallout 4, it wasn't uh, any other game. I mean, yeah, Witcher 3, I think, all around was just like kind of like one of the best games of this generation. And it's a very like common opinion too. You'd hope that it would it'd be some kind of like sleeper or outlier or something like that. But there, the content on these consoles the past six years has been kind of lackluster. There's not really a lot of like heavy hitters that just really, like even Red Dead 2, which was really good, I mean, it plays very similarly to Red Dead 1, and then there, there's some just general issues I have with with how it plays, you know? And it is a Rockstar game at the end of the day. I've played that before. I really hadn't played anything quite like Witcher 3 before. It was doing its own thing, so... But anyways, I digress. Um, yes, the point of this video is I just wanted to talk about the uh, recent Microsoft acquisitions, what they've been doing, and why I think that it they just need to can they just plea please buy other side entertainment and help us get system shock 3 that we've all been hoping for anyways thank you guys for joining me um, that'll be it for this video take care